his love and I will praise him perfect love beyond compare through the years and changing seasons every moment he's been there God is patient kind and faithful always seeking to restore in the midst of all our struggles his great love stands strong and sure welcoming both saint and sinner reaching out to all the world bearing all our shame and failure Christ is all in all. God is steadfast and long-suffering. In his arms we are secure. Those who walk the path of sadness, he will strengthen and uphold. Welcoming both saint and sinner, Reaching out to all the world, bearing all our shame and failure, Christ is all in all. Seek the best for one another, celebrate the joy of life, treat with kindness far off strangers, cherish mercy, truth and love and love and love and love hello and welcome as we gather to worship and praise our great god of love this service is a communion service when we will through bread and wine remember the greatest sign of god's love ever christ's death for us on the cross and if you want to join in with us as we share communion then have some bread and a cup of something and we will eat and drink together later on first though let's come before god in prayer let us pray dear god Thank you for your wonderful, glorious love. The love that comes to us not when we deserve it, but when we need it. The love that nothing can take us away from. The love that became human and lived among us in Jesus Christ. As we worship you today, please come and fill our hearts with your love through your Holy Spirit and may it pour out from us as we go from here changing and transforming those we'll meet in Jesus name Amen John writes in his first letter see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. God's love is great and wonderful and glorious. And so let's sing those words together. How wonderful, how glorious is the love of God. of God, bringing healing, forgiveness, a wonderful love, how wonderful, how glorious is the love of God, bringing healing, forgiveness, a wonderful love, let celebration echo through this land. Reconciliation we bring hope to every man. 
man How wonderful, how glorious Is the love of God Bringing healing, forgiveness A wonderful love We proclaim the kingdom of our God is here Come and join the heavenly anthem Ringing loud and ringing clear How wonderful, how glorious Is the love of God Bringing healing, forgiveness A wonderful love Listen to the music As His praises fills the air With joy and with gladness Tell the people everywhere How wonderful, how glorious how wonderful Is the love of God Bringing God. healing, forgiveness A wonderful love How wonderful, how glorious Is the love of God Let's come before God in his wonderful, glorious love with our own personal prayers. Let us pray. Thank God for his love for you and all that that love means to you. Praise God for showing his love for us in Jesus, sending him to live, die and rise again for us and for the world. In his great love for us, God seeks to forgive and cleanse us from our sins. And so confess your sins to him now. And bring to God the deep desires of your heart, whether for yourself or someone else. We bring our prayers to God in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This reading comes from Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Thank you, Barry, for that reading. And our second reading comes from the book of John, from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? 
Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. May God bless to us the reading of his word today. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We hear those words most often at Christmas, which for us in the Northern Hemisphere is the darkest time of the year. And perhaps it's that seemingly all-pervading darkness that makes us thrill to those words and long for them to be true even more than at any other time of the year. We long for light in the middle of the darkness of winter. And in the darkness of our world and all that's going on, we long for Christ's light to shine and drive away that darkness. The light shines in the darkness. We want to stand in the light. But the thing about moving out from darkness into light is that it's not always a comfortable or easy experience. You know how it is when you're uh, in a train tunnel or a road tunnel and it's dark all around you and suddenly you're out into the brightness of the light and it takes your eyes a few moments to adjust. Or when you're nicely asleep in a darkened room and someone turns the light on or opens the curtains. Ah, no, no, shut them again. Or maybe when you're out in the car and car coming towards you is those stupidly bright leds or has left their full beams on and you can't see for a moment it's it's dazzling light shining in the darkness can be dazzling can be confusing can be disorientating nicodemus is taking his first steps from darkness into light as he goes to visit Jesus. And it's not an easy experience for him. It starts in darkness, starts in the physical darkness. It, John tells us that he came to Jesus at night. But by that, John isn't just meaning the very deep darkness that I'm sure would have been there in first century Palestine, much darker than the nights here in Manchester with all the light pollution. Darkness represents something more in John's Gospel. It, it represents not knowing. It represents mystery. It can also represent evil and opposition to what God is doing in Jesus. And that's where Nicodemus starts. But he's not going to end there, as we'll see. But his journey into the light is not an easy one. He seems dazzled, confused, not understanding what Jesus is saying, what it all means. And you can sense that confusion in the conversation. They almost seem to be talking about completely different things. It all stems from these words of Jesus that in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Nicodemus understands that as being physically born again and it seems a nonsense to him. How can that happen? How can I go back into my mother's womb and, and be born again? He never asks the question of whether his mother would want that to happen, but that's, you know, that's by the by. But of course, Jesus doesn't mean physical birth. Jesus is talking about something else. That phrase, being born again, 
can also mean or be translated being born from above. This is a new or a second birth, but not a physical second birth. This is being born of God, of God working so wonderfully and so radically in our lives that it's like starting a whole new life, seeing things no longer according to the ways of the world, but according to the ways of God, having our eyes adjusted so that we don't shrink back from the light, but we accept it and walk in it. It's such a radical change that Jesus likens it to being born again. And he's saying that this needs God to make it happen. Remember a few weeks ago we mentioned when uh, Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, for the first time. And Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, this was not revealed to you by humans, but by God. We can only see the light for what it is. We can only understand what Jesus is truly doing through God's Spirit at work in us, shaping us and changing us, adjusting our eyes so that the light no longer dazzles us but allows us to see things clearly. It's not an easy process. It can be a long process. Being born isn't an instant process. It can be painful, probably is. It can be difficult, it can be dangerous, and it can be long. God's work at us, in us, can be all those things as well. And this can be threatening as well. Nicodemus's fellow Pharisees, or many of them at least, won't follow the same route from darkness to light that Nicodemus is beginning on. They will turn away from the light. They won't allow it in because it threatens them, threatens their power, threatens their way of understanding the world, their way of understanding God. And they can't hack that. Light can be difficult. Light can be threatening. Light can show up the parts of our lives that we really don't want other people, and we especially don't want God, to see. Light mm, can bring them all too clearly to our minds and provoke us to ask God to do something about them. And part of the point of Lent is for God to do that and for us to ask God deliberately to show us what is not right, what doesn't belong to light in our lives, and to change it. But it's a lot easier, of course, just to pretend that they're not there, or to push away the light, to pull down the blinds, close the curtains, or try, as the Pharisees will, to snuff out the light. But Nicodemus will take a different path. Nicodemus will walk this path from darkness to light. We meet him again a few chapters after this, where the council of rulers in Jerusalem are trying to decide what to do about Jesus, who's become a threat, and the main answer seems to be to kill him. But Nicodemus, whilst not saying, hey, he's a man of God, does say, well... <laughs> Shouldn't we allow him to sort of say his piece? Shouldn't we give him a fair trial? But he's quickly slapped down and accused of being a disciple of Jesus. And then, after Jesus has died, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, also a member of this ruling council, comes to collect Jesus' body and give him the dignity of a decent burial in Joseph's tomb. And suddenly we see that the accusation of the ruling council is 100% true. Nicodemus is a disciple of Jesus. He has chosen to walk out of the darkness and into the light. That journey, I'm sure, will go on being difficult. When confronted with the empty tomb and the light of new life shining from the risen Christ, I'm sure for him and all the other disciples there were as many questions as there were answers. But the light is shining in the darkness 
And however dazzled and confused Nicodemus might be with that light, he stepped into it. And he finds what Jesus promises in those famous words of chapter 3 and verse 16. That God in his love has sent his son to take that darkness from us, to shine the light, not so that we can be condemned, but so that all that we know is wrong in our lives can be taken from us. Jesus taking it for us and God's healing, forgiving, life-changing light can shine in us. Where are you on that journey? Where am I on that journey? Does the light still seem dazzling and, and confusing? Do we still feel we've got as many questions as we have answers? Do we still feel very often that Jesus is talking on a completely different level to us? Are there times when we want to turn away from that light because it challenges the stuff we know isn't right? Are we willing to allow God's cleansing, healing light in Jesus to open our eyes, to help us see what Jesus came to do and what the Spirit of God still longs to do in our lives? And then are we willing to allow that light to shine out from us, not because we're any good, but because God can shine his light through anyone? Are we willing to allow it to show to the people around us? through the things we do and the things we say it might dazzle them it might confuse them they might not understand it particularly when living in that light means acting in a different way from the world and maybe they'll want to turn their faces away where are we on this journey from darkness to light how can we help each other and help those who are new on this journey and how can we continue ourselves walking towards the light, not turning our eyes away from it, but allowing God to adjust our sight so that we see him and walk in his light?
Let us pray together. Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul's words of how this special time came to be. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here is the love of God, shown in the most simple yet powerful signs. The bread, the broken body of Jesus. The cup the blood of Jesus that seals God's great promise and agreement with us. They are ours to take and to share. As we do so, though, we need to remember that we're not doing this for God in order to impress him or gain something from him or to show him how perfect we are. But we're doing it to remember how he has done everything for us through Jesus and how he asks us to do nothing more or less than to receive his freely given love and to let it shape our lives and so if you need to know that love today then come and eat with us come and drink with us let us pray Loving God, we're here not because we're worthy to come here and share your feast, but because you've called us to through Jesus Christ. It's because of him that we can know your love, because of his body broken for us, because of his blood shed for us, sealing your promise to save and give life to us and the world. So we come together to share this meal. As we do, we say thank you, thank you for the greatness of your love. As we share bread and wine, let your Holy Spirit be with us. Let us know the wonder of your love, the depths of your grace, the newness of your life. And let us be ready to tell and show others these things in everything we do, so that they too may know you, love you, 
and thank you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take this and remember God's great love for you in Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you and me that we might be one with him and with each other. We drink together with thanks. Loving God, you have reminded us through what we've shared at this table of just how much you love us, giving your Son to die for us, being our God and making us your people. For all of this, we want to say thank you and tell you we love you. Help us in the week ahead to always remember these special things. Give us your Holy Spirit to remind us of your love when we need it most and to love each other. And help us to find the words and the actions that will tell others that you love them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we remember and share this great love of God for us, let's bring our prayers for those who need that love especially today. Let's pray for the people of Ukraine. Let's pray for the people of Syria and Turkey. Let's pray for those who are caught up in conflicts and disasters that don't make the headlines, but which God knows about. Let's pray for those who are struggling with their physical health. Let's pray for those who are struggling with their mental health. Let's pray for those who don't yet know God's love, that they might do so.
And let's pray for the people we know and love and we want to pray for to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, in your love, hear our prayers and our remembrances for those who have gone from us, but who are now in your light and love. We remember all of them before you, Lord. And we remember particularly in this moment all those who have been part of our family at Greenfield, but who are now with you. We remember Eric Auden, Ada Smales, Jack Byrne, Daisy Burdett, Harry Murray, Audrey Beattie. We remember Muriel Tong, Muriel Lean, Elsie Crosley, Leonard Sidgwick, Peggy Dalgleish, Winnie Smales. We remember Elizabeth Cowan, Jeannie Hobbs, Hilary Ashton, Beryl Molyneux, Marjorie Lane, and Mel Hazelwood. And we remember Harry Withers, Dave Layton, Margaret Simpson, Derek Armstrong, and Roy Heath. Lords, may they rest in peace and rise in glory. May light perpetual shine upon them. And may the light and the love that they now know to its their fullest be ours to keep and to treasure and to share with others until the day you call us back to you as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've heard throughout this service of the great and mysterious and wonderful love of God. Let's respond by declaring our love for him, however weak and faltering that might be. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. At the 
wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home And we close as we always do by sharing the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you as always for watching or listening to this service. Take care, God bless and stay safe. Bye bye.